Buddhists and Christians around the world have entered into dialogue. And as this dialogue has deepened, some of them have taken it within themselves. They have not only studied the beliefs of their dialogue partners, but have gone on voyages of discovery that embrace both Buddhist and Christian spiritual practices. In this series of profiles, we are going to meet some of these explorers and listen to the stories of their inner journeys. So my name is Don Mitchell, and I teach comparative philosophy of religion at Purdue University. And I've been teaching there since 1971. Um, before that, I was at the University of Hawaii, where I received my doctorate and then went straight to Purdue. And uh, since then, I've been involved in interfaith relations. Uh, got started in the late, late 70s. And uh, shortly after, I converted and became a, a Roman Catholic. Before that, I had been practicing Zen for 10 years, uh, about eight years, actually, I guess. And uh, after being involved in the dialogue, I uh, began to, well, I guess one of the first things I, I did in the dialogue was to get involved in what's called the Society for Buddhist Christian Studies. And I've been an executive officer in that society ever since then. And um, made some contacts with some folks that are in charge of interfaith relations with the Catholic Church here in the United States and began to work with them. And now I'm in advisory capacity for a number of Catholic organizations uh, involved in interfaith relations. In my youth, I was raised in a, a congregational church, and I had uh, gained a great affection, I guess you could say, for the scripture and uh, some knowledge of, of scripture, but um, became a bit disillusioned with the faith early on. Um, Looking back now, I think that the reason why I left, which I've only come to understand in recent years, is because I came from a family um, situation, not terribly serious, but it was the kind of thing where I really didn't uh, experience um, love and affection and, and much peace and harmony around the house. I was just sort of in a state of fearfulness and afraid of what might happen at any particular time, given the situation. And when I went to the church, um, I experienced a great amount of family unity and affection and love, and that was a strong topic in our church. And when I would go home, I would experience the opposite. It made me very upset. And I, as a kid, I couldn't say that, well, there was something wrong with my family. So I figured there must be something wrong with the church, because each time I went to church, I'd come home upset. Um, and so I left the church, but I think there was always gnawing inside of me, uh, mixed with this inner um, fearfulness, sometimes terror, uh, a need, a deep need for uh, integration, a need for uh, love, a need for some kind of unity, embracement in, in my heart. And so in college, I was traveling overseas and became sick in the hospital with a, a disease and, and had to come back home because of it. And it, it really uh, brought me face to face with some ultimate issues about life and about myself. And and some existential questions. I was a student in college at the time, a philosophy student. And, um, and so I began to look for answers because I was looking for answers in terms of experience because this inner turmoil was surfacing and I became very depressed because of it. Again, not understanding the source of it because I refused to understand, I refused to acknowledge you know, what was taking place in the home. So um, I turned to Zen. One of my teachers was a Zen Buddhist, and I started practicing Zazen. And I would say mainly uh, therapeutically, looking for this inner peace, this inner connectedness to life, which I understood Buddhist enlightenment to bring about. 
Um, so my practice then was doing zazen under this teacher, and I was uh, uh, moved. I don't know how to say it, except I, I, there wasn't any great success right away. It wasn't that my life turned around just by doing zazen for some months, but there was some impulse inside of me that wanted me to continue, that moved me to continue in this direction. So I decided to pursue uh, graduate studies in Asian comparative philosophy with an emphasis on Zen Buddhism. Went to Hawaii, and my teacher in uh, San Diego, where I was raised, uh, had me uh, go to what is called the Diamond Sangha, which is the uh, community of Bob Aiken, Sikh and Roshi, in Hawaii. And so I became a member of that Sangha. I remember the first time I went, uh, sitting quietly watching this uh, Japanese Zen monk carrying a stick, sometimes hitting people on the back for, later I found out there was a rationale, but <laughs> at that time I wasn't sure what was going on. Bells ringing, uh, gongs, chanting, incense, and I thought to myself as I left, what in the world am I doing here? This is like a whole other world. I, I, and yet there was this inner impulse, you know, there's something here, and, and there was some need uh, connected to that impulse that, that really impelled me to keep going back. Eventually, you asked me, you know, what, what was it like in that Zen community? Eventually, I began to understand the landscape of Zen. I began to understand um, what was going on in the Zendo during practice. I began to understand the um, different ways that, that Zen is nourished. Zen as a reality, not just as a practice, but Zen is nourished in, in, that, in that environment and with the teacher. Um, and it began to bear fruits. I, I did feel, for the first time in, in my life, uh, a deep connection with the world around me, with other people, with nature especially, and, and in Hawaii it's hard not to feel one with nature, it's so beautiful. Um, I began to appreciate and savor the present moment and to realize the fullness of the present moment, the interconnectedness of life in the present moment. Um, I began to feel a sense of strength building within myself, a solidarity uh, or solidity within, within my own being. Um, uh, I could say that I, I tapped into wellsprings of joy uh, as well as peace. Uh, it was very enriching and, and a very beautiful um, milieu, I guess I could say, moving into a new milieu, a new, a new mode of living, a new way of being in the world. Um, and I was very happy. I would say I was. I found a, a certain degree of happiness that I never, uh, never realized before. And yet, because I never did face this, this um, inner terror, this inner demon, whatever you want to call it, from my childhood, it was always there too. Um, and so, eventually, I graduated from Hawaii and moved to Indiana. And that was difficult. You don't find too many Buddhists in Indiana, um, even now, but back in, in the early 70s, even less. And the religion, the practice, the experience, the realities that had brought me integration and the sense of wholeness and inner coherence in Hawaii did the opposite in Indiana. It, in a sense, made me feel more alienated from my environment, which was a strongly Christian environment. Um, I think I also had a fear of Christianity uh, for a couple of reasons. One reason is that, that um, when I was in the Buddhist uh, world, I heard many stories about how Christians had treated Buddhists in the past. And I had this feeling that maybe you can't really trust Christians that came out of my involvement in the Buddhist community. Um, also, part of my story when I was back in college at the time that I was sick was that I did have a certain experience, a 
certainly I guess we call mystical experience uh, not as, as a huge mystical thing but there is a certain experience of God and God as being connected to that impulse to move into the Zen world and my feeling was that God was going to bring me back from the Zen world into Christianity and I didn't want to go there and I really didn't want to become a Christian and I was afraid of God I think I projected onto God things from my father so it was a very fearful image that I had of God um, and it would it would somehow tie into this inner uh, inner anguish uh, inner fearfulness in my own heart so there were uh, there was this struggle going on when I moved to Indiana there was this inner struggle with with God although I didn't know what it is I'm looking back now and I have some distance on it and finally it reached a head because um, after a couple of years I wasn't sure about my career there was a number of kind of crises that everybody has oftentimes you know you're entering into a career and you have doubts about it um, and suddenly the the zazen whatever could no longer me no longer keep under control these demons that I had inside of me and as they began to surface I felt very hopeless um, and uh, my thought was to commit suicide to tell you the truth and it was only then that Christianity looked like it might be a uh, reasonable alternative which shows you how bad I thought about Christianity it was only when compared to death that I thought well maybe this is a better <laughs> better way to go so this happened uh, this realization happened in the middle of the night and so I called a priest friend my wife was always a good Roman Catholic and, and so I had met a, a very nice priest through her and, and I read Thomas Merton and I understood um, the value of Christian spirituality and monasticism as it was flowered in the Catholic tradition so I had certain positive views and I thought well if I'm going to jump into Christianity then maybe this is a place to go I mean it worked for Merton maybe it'll work for me and so I called a priest and asked him to come over and baptize me in the middle of the night and uh, I remember afterwards I laid down in the bed and I, I closed my eyes and I had a dream imagination kind of thing and I was I w found myself walking along and then in front of me was standing there Bob Bacon and some other Buddhists and they were looking at me and then they all looked in this direction and there was a light on her face in that direction and I thought oh I'm going to turn now and I'm going to see the light <laughs> I'm going to understand things and I turned and it was just darkness but I realized I was making a good turn that in the end the connections that I had with the Buddhist world had led me to this point and that wherever I was going along that line I would be in unity with Buddhism with my Buddhist friends and would contribute to uh, a connection between where I'm going to go into Christianity and the Buddhist world and that would be good for the Buddhists as well as for the Christians. I'm looking back now and interpreting the dream. At the time, I just had this feeling I made, I'm making the right turn here. This is the correct way to go. The priest showed up and uh, informed me that in the Catholic Church, they don't just baptize you on the spot. You know. <laughs> and so it led to a process of conversion into, into the church. Um, and the conversion, uh, eventually began to bore bear fruit. I remember at the beginning I thought, you know, I know theologically, I mean, I, I had studied philosophy, I knew something about uh, God, Jesus Christ, and whatever. But somehow in my heart, I really didn't understand what these realities were. I mean, what exactly is God? You know, what, what is this Jesus Christ and the Church and Mary, the Holy Spirit? I mean, I had a lot of questions. And uh, I remember sitting down and talking about that with David Steindl Rast and uh, Brother David said uh, well you don't have to know all the answers now what you need to do is to live what you do understand and slowly you'll move into these answers and you find these answers in the context of living the Christian life and so that's how I came into the church and that's how I began to live the Christian life 
about a couple of years later, I was looking for some kind of Christian spirituality because um, in Buddhism, as you know, uh, especially in Zen Buddhism, uh, practice is a daily living. It's, it's not something that you just do once in a while. It's, it's how you live. It's, it's a formation of your very being uh, in life. And as a layperson, I was looking for a, a spirituality, and um, I found a spirituality called Focolare, which is a lay spirituality in the Catholic tradition, which also has a very strong interfaith dimension to it. And so it seemed to fit. And so I took that up as my particular practice, and uh, that's where I've gone. Um, so I think what you ask is, how I kind of moved into Zen, what I found there, and then how I moved into Christianity. I think those are perhaps the pieces of the puzzle. In terms of what I talk about in spirituality and emptiness, about God and, and emptiness, uh, about ultimate reality, I guess I'd have to go a little further in the story that I just, just told you. Um, as I evolved in my in uh, the Christian life and Christian spirituality, um, I went through a period of time where uh, it was a sort of a dark moment. It sounds like all my life has been dark, but it hasn't been. It's been uh, good times, normal times, whatever. But there was a particular time, uh, and during that time, I, I found myself. Uh, more open to Christian contemplation. Um, and through that experience, I, I guess I realized or I found that, that Christian contemplation is not something that you can produce. Sometimes I read these stories and uh, uh, articles in newspapers or whatever, and, and it's almost like people are looking for a, some kind of magical button, you know, to, to push that opens the, the contemplative life. And, you know, or practice meditation this way, or do this, or whatever. Um, and I think there are ways that can open us to uh, that dimension, that can make us receptive to that dimension of life. Um, but ultimately, my experience is that uh, it's something that God gives you. It's something that, that is, a, is a grace. And maybe even somebody doesn't particularly want to or never even thought about it being open to it, and all of a sudden, bang, there it is. You know? um, and it's a grace that I think not only brings us to a deep sense of God's presence in and through the world, which would in some ways be similar to the Zen experience, the Zen experience of the interrelatedness of life, the, this fundamental, original nature of who we really are, and not just we in the little sense, but in the universal sense of, of this self that manifests um, as me in, in this very concrete identity that I have. Um, so. The Christian contemplation moves us to, to understand that depth level of life where we're, in a sense, spoken from God and we're spoken together with, as one with, uh, humankind and, and life itself. Um, but I think Christian contemplation also moves us through that experience to realize that there is another side. There's, there's a transcendent dimension. Um, it is imminent, yes, in the world. God is imminent in the world. Uh, everything is woven together out of his love, held together in his, his love. And of course, this is what I was looking for as a child. Um, and so that's there, yes. And yet, it's a hand of God's love, that God's uh, intimate, loving touch that extends through his arm, you might say, to uh, the Trinity, to a reality that underlies, that, under, that, gr that grounds our existence, that we can come to appreciate, that, that is ultimately a kind of uh, uh, 
where life is an expression of silence. Life is coming out of that silence. And yet, contemplation can move us through that silence and into a kind of infinite um, Trinitarian life that is, that is beyond this horizon in which we live. Um, and so, when I look back at, at uh, Zen, my, my impression was, and, and, and continues today, that Zen gives us an indication of that silent, uh, mystical horizon as it's played out in the interrelatedness of life in a way that's transformative. And when one looks at that horizon, that emptiness, um, that dynamic emptiness, uh, one is encountering the infinite, and so therefore it looks like that's it. And yet, through the grace of God in, in Christian contemplation, one realizes that that infinite opens up on the other side. That's why I talk about this other side, into uh, the life that we will share with God after we die, into the, 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 the paradise that we call uh, the Trinity. And so that's where I kind of came to this fundamental distinction. So I believe that the experience of Zen is absolutely authentic, it's healing, it is universal, it tells us the existential truth about our being, about life, um, and yet there's something about God as Father, Son, Holy Spirit and that, inf that infinite love that we call the Trinity uh, expressed in these three persons these three realities uh, in this dynamic that, that Christian meditation, Christian contemplation leads one to. And so because of that, I, I can't sit down and just say, yes, Zen and Christianity are leading to the same thing. It is the same. It's in the sense that it's God. It's the divine. It is um, God. But yet Christianity sees a side, a dimension to the divine life that is, is for me something extraordinarily precious that I don't find within Zen. It doesn't contradict Zen at all. Uh, I think it complements it. And I think Zen has a lot to teach us because sometimes I think Christian contemplation looks too much to the transcendent. It doesn't take uh, account of God's presence in, in nature. So that's kind of the uh, where I came to this distinction in terms of my own experience of the two traditions. I found that after getting involved in the dialogue and working in the dialogue uh, some years ago, uh, God moved me not to understand him so much or, or God as such, but to begin to understand myself. In other words, uh, those demons that were planted in me uh, as a child began to finally surface. And uh, my journey into Zen, my journey into Christian contemplation, Christian, Christian practice, um, finally led me to myself, to face myself. And here we enter more, I guess, from spirituality into psychology. I think is one of your interests as well. And, you know, I can just share with you what that journey has been. I have not yet really reflected upon it. I don't have the, the tools yet to really reflect much on it. But um, my feeling is that, that perhaps at a certain point in the journey, God wants to love us as we truly are and not how we have made ourselves to be by defensive mechanisms and habits and patterns that we've developed to respond to, to deal with the demons inside of us or the issues, the, the anger, the fear, whatever it might be within our hearts. And so therefore he wants to have us face these things bring it to our awareness, 
deal with it, feel it, integrate it, however you want to say it, so that we become truly who we are so he can relate to us truly as we are rather than relate to us as we have tried to make ourselves to be in reaction to these things that are going on unconsciously within us. So this began a journey of, of really psychoanalysis uh, or psychotherapy, not so much in the traditional Freudian sense, but a journey of, of recollecting, facing these things, um, letting out the anger, letting out the sadness, all of these things, and slowly realizing the ways in which I have molded myself the ways in which I've used my mind intellectually to maintain a distance. I found that in this latter journey of self-understanding, self-discovery, that I found even other parallels with Zen. And when I talked a bit with Zen teachers about this process, um, they also understand it in terms of their, their tradition too terms of, of self-realization, self-healing, or healing of the self, and such. Um, and so that's, I think, another dimension is that the spiritual life does not just include understanding some things about God, um, but it, it, in, it involves a, a discovery and a becoming of who we really are, and a finding of the very foundation of our life where all of these, um, the rawness of whatever this is that we carry, original sin, whatever it is we carry from our, the previous generations that uh, have this power over us, that has this power to, to affect our lives and affect who we are, <coughs> that there's a healing that takes place <coughs> and a freedom that, that God really does enter into that and bring about a freedom. Doesn't mean it just disappears, but there's a new freedom there to, to overcome it and to be who we really are in relation to God, to other people, and uh, ultimately to ourselves. Um, and that's a part of the journey that I'm just um, slowly moving through. And so take me another 10 years, maybe I'll have else to say about it, but uh, um, I guess I just wanted to say that this, the spiritual life in Christianity is not, is about a relationship, and it's about both sides of the relationship. God, yes, but also ourselves, and a fullness of that relationship and love means that both sides have to be true and authentic. God is, by nature, true and authentic we, by our nature, the nature of original sin and what we've made ourselves to be, need some work. And uh, that healing process of psychology, of, of our psychology, of our, our psyche, shall I say, um, is a big part of the spiritual dynamic. <clears throat> and I think that's the other thing I've come to appreciate in, in Christianity is that this gets played out in this relational dimension with God that is um, what I've been looking for, I think, since I was a little kid. Mm -hmm.